Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the feast of, it's a spiritual feast of the Day of Atonement. Let's ask God's blessing for us this, on this very special day. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and your precious Son, Yeshua, our King, our Savior, our big brother, our husband-to-be. And we just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name that you will just rain down your Holy Spirit upon us as we listen, as we speak in this particular sermon about a very powerful, actually a very positive day to come. We're going to talk about that. Please inspire the speaking and the preaching to be exactly right and put it, Father, please, in the minds of people how you want them to hear it as well and what they need to hear. We look forward to this day, Father, the day of reconciliation of all mankind someday to you. And we look forward to all, the, all, all of the meaning of this day, the jubilees, everything that happened on the Day of Atonement. We praise you, we love you, we trust you. Thank you on this day. Yeshua's mighty name, amen. So welcome to the day of fasting. When was the last day you fasted? I mean, a spiritual fast. I don't mean intermittent fasting, which is good for your health too, I suppose, but I'm talking about spiritual fasting, going without a food or water for a whole 24 hours. Was it last year at atonement? I hope not. I hope, I hope you're fasting more than that. Paul spoke about being in fastings often, so I hope that we are following that example. So welcome uh, to Light on the Rock. Uh, we're trying very hard here to point people to have a deeper love for God Almighty, Abba, or God Most High, and Yeshua, His Son. And so and also to learn to live by faith with uh, our God and to have a tremendous love for uh, humanity. Uh, good people, so-called bad people, our enemies, love them, love your enemies. And so, um, also I'm hoping that we as God's people who have God's spirit, though we may have some slight differences in doctrine here or there, as long as they're not the salvational differences, I'm hoping that we can come together more and get, get more united, more just one body more like we should be. And I really don't feel Yeshua is going to come marry a bride composed of individuals from different corporate bodies who, for the most part, don't want anything to do with each other. I really can't see that. So let's come together and let's not box God into preconceived notions of what he's like and where he is and where he's working and not working. Check out our blogs, too. Uh, look on our website. Check out our blogs. We'll try to show you a couple here where it just says blogs. Go down. On the home page, just scroll down, go down to where you see blogs. And we're trying to put more and more interesting short articles, five, six, seven minute reads. And um, uh, there's a new one there. Don't just go hungry on the Day of Atonement. We can show it and um, check them out. Feel free at the very bottom of these blogs uh, to rate it. Five star, of course. <laughs> no, rate it, please. And then to, uh, uh, I think you can very easily leave comments on the blogs. If you're having any trouble leaving comments, let us know. Now, also right above the blogs, you find audio sermons, and then higher above that, you see video sermons. If you want to watch the video, make sure you click on the button. Let's show them where it says video. I've had a couple of people say, I hit the video, but all I hear is audio. So you have to hit the, the little arrow that says video. And then you'll watch my handsome face talking to you all during that time. Anyway, I'll get into the many nuances of atonement. I hope you guys know when I'm teasing. I know I'm not handsome. I mean, this is, this is quite the mug, isn't it? <laughs> I'll get into the many nuances of atonement shortly, but let's start with this. The Bible says on this day you are to afflict your souls, and most of us understand that. We'll put the scriptures up here. Afflict your souls, and we'll read them later. But I'm sure most of you under, that are hearing this understand that it has a reference to fasting. No food, no water for 24 hours, sundown to sundown. David said he humbled and afflicted his soul with fasting. Psalm 35, 13 and 69, 10. Daniel was fasting in Daniel 9 when he was praying to God. Uh, and God answered him with that fabulous prophecy, the 70-week prophecy. He was fasting and repenting for his own sins and those of the nation. And so fasting, afflicting your soul is often combined with, often combined with uh, repentance and seeking after God. So that's the point I want to get off right off the bat. Don't let this just be a day 
of doing without food and going hungry with your no caffeine headache, wondering why you're fasting or what good did it do you. Make a point to read that blog. Let's show them again. Don't just go hungry on the Day of Atonement. Go back and read Isaiah 58. It should be a day that changes us, a day when we're confessing areas of our life, when we're still too self-centered, when we still don't uh, act and look like and live like God would. And so it's a day of just confessing where you need to change. Don't let it be just a day of going out without food. Okay, Yom Kippurim, you might, might know it as the day of Yom Kippur. Uh, the Bible actually, when you look at the Hebrew, where it says Day of Atonement or the Day of Atonement, in the Hebrew it's Hayom Kippurim. Ha means the, Yom means day, it's not Yom, Yom means sea. Y-O-M, Yom means day, and then Kippurim is actually in the Hebrew. We call it Yom Kippur, which is singular. But Kippur, Kippurim has to, has to do with covering and um, uh, covering and atonement uh, has to do with reconciling, expiation of sins, being brought back together. Uh, it's a day of atonement, our, our sins being atoned for. We used to always call it the day of at one -ment, and that's the net effect of what happens, but that has nothing to do with the Hebrew. The Hebrew meaning is atone, cover, and so on, okay? Kippurim is the plural, and it's in the plural in Leviticus 23 and many other places because there are so many people and so many things that are being atoned for, covered with blood, made righteous, uh, made holy, and, and acceptable to God. So for time's sake, you'll have to go through some of the scriptures that I just note in my notes and so I can cover everything I need to. So Leviticus 16, verses 30 to 33, says the high priest on this day makes atonement for you so you may be clean before God, verse 30. And then in verse 33, uh, there is kippur, kippurim going on, covering, sanctifying, cleansing, atoning with the blood of the bulls and goats for the holy sanctuary, the tabernacle itself and everything in it, the altar, uh, the altar of incense that mentions horns of the altar just before you go into the Holy of Holies and to atone for all the priests, Aaron and his sons and all the priests and for all the people. Everything got covered by God's grace. So on this day, God's covering everything in his service to him that's been defiled by sin or sinful servants. And the word Kippur has much, much more to do with covering than it does with at one minute, Okay based on the English. So today's a very positive day. I want to talk about the positive things about atonement. We'll talk about some other things too. Jews believe that starting on the Feast of Trumpets, or they call it Rosh Hashanah wrongly, it's not the head of the year, it's Yom Teruah, Yom Teruah, which means a day of blasts, shouting, noise, jubilees, and joyous shouts, and screams of horror depending on which side you're on, and trumpet blasts, shofar blasts, all of that going on. And I should have my shofar again that today, but I don't, because uh, Jubilee also, they blew the shofar. And, uh, but anyway, the, they believe that they'll keep their names in the book of life, in the Creator's book of life, for one more year. God's a little stingy. God just gives them one year at a time of being in the book of life. So from the days, from the day of trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, um, on, on the Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, to Yom Kippur, it's 10 days there, they call those the 10 days of awe. 10 days of awe, time to really repent, to seek God, to ask him to please consider you again in the book of life for another year. I saw a uh, bumper sticker one time while I was in Jerusalem in 1973. I was there at the dig and uh, they had all kinds of funny things that I can still remember. Let my people go go was one of the dance places. <laughs> and, then they, and then they had uh, a bumper sticker that says, repent now, avoid the Yom Kippur rush. So um, 
It's a time of, of repentance and a time of seeking God. I asked a rabbi friend of mine some years ago how he viewed the judgment of God. <clears throat> and he said, how are you going to fare in the judgment? And his reply was, they don't say God. So he said, Hashem, which means the name. Hashem puts my life in his way scales. And if he finds that I've done more good things than bad things, I'm good. If I've done more bad things, I'm in trouble. No mention of the need of a savior or God covering his sins with God's own righteousness as they still have the veil over their eyes over that kind of thing when they read the Tanakh, which is their word for what we call the Old Testament. So anyway, there's much more positive than just having your name in the Book of Life for one year. Frankly, your name and my name should be in the Book of Life right now, sealed there forever, hopefully. Although God does say that he can blot your name out or a name out of the Book of Life. He can erase it. So anyway, so for many Jews who know they've not been good, these 10 days leading up to atonement are pretty dreadful, probably, and yet it's actually a very positive day. So what's atonement all about? Let's, let's do the run-up to it first again. Passover, we come under the blood of the Lamb of Yeshua, and uh, he passes over our sins. That's where we get the word Passover from. And then soon after Passover is Wave Sheaf Day. It varies from year to year. When Yeshua was resurrected just, just before that and goes up to heaven to be accepted on our behalf. And uh, the, the harvest can start. The spiritual harvest can start. Then the days of unleavened bread, when we completely take in Yeshua. It doesn't mean that I'm righteous for seven days and per perfectly and all that. We used to believe that. I, I, some of you still believe that. No, the, the unleavened bread, the perfect bread, the sinless bread is Yeshua. And I take him inside of me during the days of unleavened bread, every day of it, to remind me that he is now my life. To remind me he is the unleavened bread. To remind me that he is the one that takes over my life, gives me strength, gives me sustenance. And so anyway, so the spring holy days are about the early harvest, the wheat and barley, which takes you into Pentecost. Pentecost, God set us a pattern. On Pentecost, he gave the law, the New Testament, the New Covenant. He gave the Holy Spirit. In the Old Covenant, he marries, in Tanakh, he, he marries uh, the, uh, the Israelites, Exodus 24, right around Pentecost. And he carried Israel. He married Israel, I mean, on Pentecost. Boaz and Ruth were probably married right about Pentecost because it says, in, I think it's in Ruth chapter 2, that Ruth stayed with her mother-in-law through the barley and wheat harvest. And also, so on, on the, this day sets the pattern. The book of Ruth is read. Marriages are taking place. God married on this day. And the pattern is set. It's not likely God's going to marry on a different day. And God is going to marry the first fruits. And when you look at Pentecost, it's, it's called, Pentecost is called a day of first fruits. And we are first fruits, James 1.18. We are. And uh, the two loaves that are raised on Pentecost actually says in Leviticus 23.17 at the end of the verse, they are first fruits to Yehovah. So that, so. Uh, the fall holy days are never called the first fruits holy days, but the wave sheaf, Pentecost, are. So Pentecost is about God rewarding those whom he's calling now as first fruits, and that all happens then in the early harvest in the spring. We're resurrected, I believe, on Pentecost because we're the first fruits. We're what those two leavened loaves picture being raised up and brought back down. These leavened loaves are the Lord's first fruits, Leviticus 23, 17. While we're getting married in heaven, in earth time, we're outside of time and space in heaven, but in earth time, several months are going by as the last seven bowl plagues, B-O-W-L plagues, of um, Revelation 16 are being poured out. They're pretty awful. At the end of the bowl plagues, we can now return and that's where we begin the fall holy days, 
the fall holy days, which is about God working now with the rest of the world, converting the rest of the world, little by little, not all at once. It takes time for people to respond. God gives them a choice. He doesn't force them. So the fall holy days begin with the last one we had, Yom Teruah, day of blasts, shouts, trumpets. So the autumn holy days picture God working now with the rest of the world. <clears throat> the spring holy days depicted God working with those he's calling now. So the fall holy days is God's time to focus on the rest of the world. Uh, the day of blasts, trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, it's also called a couple times the unknowable day, referred to kind of that way, because I believe the, the year he does come back to land on the Mount of Olives, I believe on trumpets, who's going to be able to see that sliver of light anywhere near Jerusalem where all this is going on? Wildfires, volcanic eruptions, warfare, who knows what's going on? The, the plague, the fifth plague was a uh, darkness. And so it'd be very, very hard to even know what day we're on. And EMPs could have blown away all of our timekeepers, you know, and cell phones and all that. Anyway, this time Yeshua is coming as a warrior and he annihilates a 200 million man army assembled down below. First thing he does is get clear of rebellion. Lands on the Mount of Olives, it splits into the next holy day is the one we're on talking about today, uh, which is the Day of Atonement. The world and its people have destroyed God's earth. There are verses where God says, I will destroy those who destroy my earth, who destroy the earth. He's landed on the Mount of Olives with his bride, glorious like he is, millions of bright, shining, holy angels with him. The world now is ready to be judged. And when he comes back, it's actually a day when God says to the world, I believe this with all my being. Because this is a day of atonement. And he's already landed on the Mount of Olives. He's already here at this point. And we're here with him as spirit beings with him, with spirit bodies. God, by the way, has, the Bible talks about a hair on his head being white as snow. It talks about his eyes and his ears and his hands, his legs, his chest. So yes, God, uh, God has a spirit body. So anyway, um, Leviticus 23, we're back, back to that. Uh, the world's been very, very sinful, and they deserve death. And frankly, the king is going to say to the world, all of you have been sinning. All of you have been going the wrong way. And quite frankly, you deserve death. But one thing about me as being king and your God is I'm willing to die for my people. And he tells the whole world, I'm not going to force you. I'll bless those of you who respond, and those of you who don't respond won't get rain. You can read that at the end of Ze Zechariah 14. I think around verse 16, 17, 18. And if they don't come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the next holy day after this one. So let's read what it says, Leviticus 23. He's going to give them an offer. But let's read more about the holy day first. Leviticus 23. I want you to note how many times God tells them, please do not work on this day. Do not work. Yeah, so God spoke to Moses and tells him, on the tenth day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar, shall, uh, works out to about September our time, shall be the day of atonement. And that's the Hebrew of Hayom Kippurim, plural, atonements, plural, coverings. It shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall afflict your soul fast and offer an offering made by fire to Jehovah. We don't do the offering because Yeshua is now our offering and all the sacrifice and all that. You shall do no work on that same day, for it's the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Jehovah your God. If any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people, it means he's going to kill him. Any person who does any work on that day, that person I will destroy from among his people. He says, are you getting it? He says it again. You shall do no manner of work. We don't eat. 
no cooking, no housekeeping, no shopping, no vacuuming, no yard work, no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So no work. I'll come back to that later on. Notice the timing. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month, on the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. On the ninth day of the month at evening, right at sundown, till evening at the end of the tenth, is so begins the the ending of what we would call the night to the end of the tenth. God's Sabbaths are always kept by starting on the sundown of the day before to the sundown of the of the day you're keeping. Now, Day of Atonement overview real quick. I said already the Jews consider this a very awesome, fearsome day. But our Creator is, uh, even though we deserve death, He's very magnanimous. And our Creator says it's an incredibly positive day, actually. The work of atoning for the sins of the world is done by the high priest alone. It's not done by anybody else, the high priest. I'll talk more about that in a minute, a few minutes. God does not want you thinking that you will be qualifying, attaining salvation, attaining the kingdom of God because of all the hard work you're doing. We're supposed to be doing good works, but we're rewarded by works. We're saved by grace. The high priest does all the work. Does all the work pictured by this day. I want you to really hammer or zone right in on that hone right in on that. We are not saved by works, but by grace. Did you notice all the verses I just read? The people are to do no work. I'll come back to that, because that's very important that we understand that on this day. And he's going to tell the world at that point, I will save you. A sacrifice for you. I'll make atonement for you. You just need to accept me as your atoning sacrifice. Anyway, there are two identical, innocent goats that play a major part on this magnificent day. It's all in Leviticus 16. I recommend you all, on your own, slowly read through Leviticus 16 and really, really get it in. Maybe read it a couple times. Both goats must be perfect, without blemish. Both goats must be healthy. Both are innocent. Both are blameless. God identifies by casting lots which one is for the uh, for the for Jehovah for the slaughtering of the blood spilling the blood because these goats picture the multifaceted work of Yeshua to his blood shed for us and taking upon himself all of our sins and taking them far away so the other goat has all the sins of the nation pronounced over his head we'll come back and read it so let me just say this right now the second goat the goat we know is Azazel, or the goat we know is a scapegoat, bad translation, was as perfect as the first, was as innocent as the first, was as faultless as the first, in far as appearance and all that. Satan has never been innocent. He's never been faultless. He's never been perfect, at least not after he attacked God in a failed coup long ago. So how could Satan be that second goat, as was commonly taught by so many? How could he be the goat of departure, which is really what Azazel points to? So let's read it. Leviticus 23, the first four verses are warnings to Aaron not to come in at just any time and what he was supposed to wear. On the Day of Atonement, he did not wear, maybe you can show you these big priestly robes that a priest would, high priest would normally wear, on the Day of Atonement, he was simply a much more like a regular priest, just in a clean white linen garment, robe, and trousers underneath to keep it uh, to keep it uh, moral and all of that, you know. And also, uh, he, um, I think he had a sash around his waist, and but but none of the none of the other things that you have with a with a priestly, high priestly garment. Leviticus 23, verse 5 to 10. He started out with clean white linen garments. I want you to think about how he looked when he was done. He shall take from the congregation, the high priest, 
of the children of Israel, two kids, doesn't mean two children, <laughs> two kids, baby goats, of the goats as a sin offering. Both goats are pictured here as a sin offering. Later on, the one that was slaughtered, more specifically called the sin offering, one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself, make atonement for himself and his household. He, that means all the other priests. So the bull was sacrificed to make atonement, reconciliation, because they too were human and they too failed at times. Both goats are, in verse 5, considered a sin offering. Now in verse 8, it will speak of a scapegoat. It's a terrible translation of the Hebrew word azazel. I don't capitalize the Zazel because it's not referring to a being. It's referring to departure, being sent away. It, doesn't repair, it certainly does not refer to a spirit demon. It just means the goat of departure. It certainly cannot be the name of a demon, as even some translations seem to imply, that God somehow told them, now get this, that somehow God told them Offer the one goat for Jehovah and offer the other goat to Azazel, the spirit demon in the wilderness. That is preposterous and wicked. He never would have had them sending a goat as a sacrifice or an atonement or an offering of some kind to a spirit demon out there. That's preposterous and evil. So please don't think of that. God would have never done that. Are you kidding me? Anyway, verse 7, Leviticus 23, verse 7. He shall take the two goats, present them before Jehovah at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Jehovah, the other for the Azazel, goat of departure. Uh, Aaron shall bring the goat on which Jehovah's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. Verse 10, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the go to departure, the, the Azazel, shall be presented alive to Jehovah to make atonement upon it, to make atonement upon it, to make atonement upon it, and to let it go as a scapegoat or as a departure goat into the wilderness. Somehow, enough people believe this picture is Satan that somehow he's wormed his way into the, one of the most holy of holy days, the Day of Atonement, if it's not the most holy, that atonement is made to him somehow, upon him. Since when does a, Satan have anything to do with atonement? Never. Show me a single verse that says that, that he has anything to do with atonement. Verses 11 to 14 is about the bull and its blood that's sprinkled all over to cover the priests and all that. And then a ram is killed for a sin offering, shedding its innocent blood. And then verse 15 to 19, it's also about the first goat that was killed and its innocent blood sprinkled also to uh, cleanse everything with the bull's blood to make atonement for the tabernacle, for the priesthood and the entire population there, it says. This included sprinkling blood on the horns of the altar of incense, which were just outside the veil, just as you would go into the Holy of Holies. So let's pick up in verse 20. I have to do this for time. Leviticus 16, verse 20 to 22. When he's made an end of atoning for the holy place, that's the first part of the tabernacle you go into. If this is the tabernacle, the first part you go into is the holy place. Then the last part is the most holy place, holy of holies. <clears throat> Bring, okay, and, and the, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins. Notice the word all all the way through here. Confess over it all their iniquities. Iniquities are terrible. These are terrible sins of the rebellious kind. The kind that you may have even known what you were doing was wrong and you still did it. Sins of, of knowledge. And then he says, concerning all their sins, transgressions at first, 
transgressions is another level of sin. And, uh, and then all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their... The goat bears on itself, because God or the high priest put all the sins on that goat, all their iniquities to an uninhabited land and shall release the goat there in the wilderness. I think what happened years ago with many of the Church of God congregations especially, we looked at Revelation 19, there's the wedding of the Lamb and all of that, and then and the beasts of false prophet are captured and thrown into a fire. End of, I think that's Revelation 19. And then Revelation 20, I don't have it in my notes, so I, I think I can do it from memory. Lever, uh, roughly, approximately. Revelation 20, verse 1, 2, 3. It says, And then I saw an angel come down out of heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, the serpent of old, it's called Satan the devil. And he bound him with his chain. And he put him into the bottomless pit and put a seal upon him where he's going to be sealed up and kept away for a thousand years. So it made sense that after Christ returns to the Mount of Olives, the next thing he would have to do is bind Satan. I think it's still possible that Satan could be bound on this day. What was wrong about the teaching was the teaching that this particular goat pictured Satan. And so I may have even myself 30 years ago or so given sermons where Christ would probably lay his hands on Satan the devil and pronounce all the sins of all mankind on him. The problem is it doesn't say that in Revelation 20. There's nothing about sins being put on Satan's head. I have no problem saying Satan could be bound on atonement. So get rid of the mocker and strife shall cease. Proverbs says that. But no sin is mentioned because he's not the one who takes our sin. So that was such a wrong-headed doctrine. So on whom are all our sins placed? On Satan? No. It can't be Satan. Never on him. Some of you others who understand all this, wondering why I'm bringing up Satan. It's because significant church groups have believed and taught for a long time, and it will a large part of atonement, Day of Atonement sermon time will be spent by many ministers talking about Satan and how all the sins are going to be put on his head and he's going to be bound and all that. Part of that may be true. He may be bound on this day, but boy, not the sins. How offensive that must have been to God. For years, as ministers taught, and still some do, that sins are placed on Satan. Of all the days in God's plan of salvation, Satan has zero part in the Day of Atonement as far as having sins being put on him. Now, here's what I, my challenge has been from, for many years now. By the word of two or three witnesses, the thing is established. Show me two or three verses that say a single sin is put on Satan's head and that he atones for our sins somehow. That he's the one who takes our sins and takes them away. No, no, it's, you're not going to find All I have to ask for is one verse. You're not going to find it. It's not there. John 1, 29 the next day, John saw Jesus um, coming towards him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, remember the Azazel goat? That Azazel goat had all the sins, but they took it away, away from the camp, who takes away the sin of the world, not just of Israel, but the world. Isaiah 53, and the end of Isaiah 53 Two, just don't get read during the Haftorah sections of the, of the uh, as far as I know, they just don't get read in the synagogues. Isaiah, the end of 52 and all of 53 is about the suffering servant, the Yeshua, the Messiah who comes the first time. 
verse 5 and 6, he was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. Bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. <clears throat> we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yehovah has laid on him, the suffering servant, this Messiah. Yehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then in verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant, same one they're talking about here, shall justify, make right, make just, make righteous, shall justify many for he shall bear, he shall bear their iniquities, the worst kinds of sins. And again, where's the scripture that says Satan bears our iniquities? Where's the verse that says Satan takes away our sins? Instead, we find instead in Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12, that God takes our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's in verse 12. So far as he removes our transgressions from, from us. He has done that. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, tells us that Christ in his own body, all talks about Christ there, that he, have, he himself, who himself bore our sins in his own body. There's no bearing of sins given to Satan. That is a very, very bad, bad doctrinal error. It's a heresy. Where's any scripture that says God puts his hands on Satan's head and confesses all the sins of the world on him? There's none. There's none. And he certainly isn't innocent. He certainly isn't perfect. And he certainly couldn't take any sins of anybody else because he's got enough of his own. To take along someone's sins, you have to be perfect. He's not. So I don't want to spend any more time going to all the technical Greek, I mean the Hebrew and all that on this. There's no verse that says Satan is that goat. Yeshua is that second goat who has all the sins confessed on him. All the wrath confessed on him. All the separation confessed on him. And he had to go outside the camp to be crucified. He bore all our sins upon himself. Don't think ever again Satan has any part in the most holy of holy days. So let's change the channel a little bit here and talk about some other things. What about the joy? What about the joy of atonement? God's son has returned by this po point with his resurrected bride. The world has gone through the seven last trumpets, the seven last plagues, and God's got their attention. The joy of being forgiven and reconciled. I believe this day, when everyone is petrified, totally fearful, what's going to happen now? For God, through the Son, will have killed hundreds of millions of people by this point in his anger, in his justice, in his vengeance on those, on the way they treated his own people. And so they're terrified. What's he going to do now? And he will tell the world, I believe on this Day of Atonement, it's meaning. I will atone for you, pictured by the ram that was slain, its blood spilt, and I will take all your sins, put it on me, like I did this, these people here who are my bride. They came in this way as well. Now it's for the rest of you, world. They had to acknowledge their sin. They had to repent. They had to accept me as their Savior. Rest of the world, I'm offering this to you, he will say. They, like we did, will also have to believe that he's the Son of God who died for my sins, who died for me. 
and obviously was resurrected. They'll see him. Remember, he's got their attention at this point. They will, like we did, confess, repent of their sins and anything that was against the way of God. And they come to water baptism, immersion into the body of Christ, brought back up into Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. And then, like we did, have to believe in him, into him. We'll talk about that sometime. Accept him as their personal Savior, Lord, and King, and Master. And then apply the meaning of the Day of Atonement to their lives and be reconciled, be reconciled to this great King who is the Son of God. And then we will lay hands on these people after they're baptized. And they will receive the Holy Spirit just like we did. And they will be renewed with a new heart. They will start to love God's law. The carnal mind, the carnal heart, hates God's law. But when God gives you a new heart, his mind, and writes his law on our hearts, we love him. We love his way. This is what this day is about. When God says to the Muslims, I can be your God too. If you want to keep believing in that moon God, that's up to you. But if you want blessings, I can bless you too. Buddhists, the Son of God died for you also. But you have to accept him as your Lord, as your Savior. Follow him. You Hindus, with all your gods and goddesses, everything that's ever lived becomes a god to you. You'll have to repent of that, depart from that paganism. Some of you Hindus are listening to me. I know you do. Other parts of the, of, of the world that are Hindu. And you need to come to the true, one living, true God who loves you too, wants you to be atoned for with your sins, who wants to bring you into his kingdom. And though it is a solemn day, it's also a day when we have elements of sheer joy. As people understand, you mean I deserve death? And you're not going to kill me? You're going to forgive me? You're going to bless me? You're going to give me the beginnings of eternal life? You're going to give me the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Remember the book of Jonah is read on this day, partly to remind us that a very evil society, so evil God was ready to blot them out, to blot them out like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, and Zoar got, got uh, spared. But remember, the book of Jonah is read to show God's mercy on a very evil society. But they had to repent first. They had to turn to God. We might talk to them about the book of Jonah. God was determined to wipe them out. They were evil. They were bloody. Violent. But he atoned for their sins, forgave them. So before we can have joy, though, the world will have to repent before they can have joy and come weeping and mourning like we did. And many of the Israelites will start the process. Once they do repent, it says there's going to be joy and peace. Remember David after he had killed Bathsheba's husband. Bathsheba means daughter of the covenant, of all things. And he killed her husband, who was one of his top military generals. And so he could, he could try to cover up his adultery with that man's wife. That's the part that God hated even more than the adultery. But he, in his prayer of repentance, says in Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And earlier he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew. Renew a right spirit within me. Because my spirit has not been right. He wanted that joy of salvation. And he said, As a result of that joy, I'm going to teach sinners your way. I'm going to bring people to you. That's partly what we have to do. Another sermon coming on that. So our high priest, our king, is going to tell the Hindus, the Muslims, the, Mu 
the Israelites, everybody, come to me on this day of, of atonement. Let me atone for your sins. Let me wipe them out. Let me wash them free and clear in my blood. Like my bride knows, they know the verse well in 1 John 1, that all of our sins are washed away in his blood. All of them. What a happy day that will be. Now let's talk about the high priest. When it comes to being atoned for your sins and being reconciled, we are not saved by our own works, folks. Excuse me. Having trouble with this today. We're not, sin we're not saved by our own works. There was someone who did a lot of work on this day. Everyone else was told, don't work. Two or three helped take the bull out to be burned, you know, the, the carcass and the offal and all that. Aside from two or three people, but mostly the high priest worked. God says, anybody else, you better just be watching. You better just be sitting, resting in your tents. So, many, many scriptures show us that Yeshua is now our high priest. We'll put those on the screen while I'm talking about it. Just keep them on the screen there at the bottom of the screen or whatever, Hebrews 3, 1 and 4, 14, 15, Hebrews 6, 20. Anyway, you'll see them there. So remember the high priest pictures Yeshua, pictures Christ. All the animals picture Christ. The altar pictures Christ. So if you start looking at the tabernacle from the outside coming in, you see this enclosure that's surrounded by white, by white curtains, if you will, or, or, or um, barrier, whatever, around it. There's one entrance to the altar, I mean to the tabernacle. One. He's the one way. There's the altar of sacrifice. First thing you come to is the altar where they burn the, the animals, sacrifice the animals. Because that's what we have to do if we have to repent. First thing we have to do is repent and be baptized. We come then to the big basin of water the priests use to wash themselves. We're immersed in baptism into Christ. And then you come into the holy place, into the tabernacle itself. On the left is the menorah, which is Christ, the light of the world. He's the big center column. They have the menorah now. They gave a picture of that. We have the menorah now in Jerusalem. That's already ready for the third temple. And many other things are ready. Here's the showbread. On the right side, as you walk in, that held the 12 loaves of bread. He's the body. His body is the veil, I mean that goes into the uh, Holy of Holies. Before that is the altar of incense. He is the blood which the high priest would sprinkle on the altar of incense outside and on, on the, the mercy seat, the ark, a beautiful ark with their angels with their wings in front, solid gold uh, covering, a box, basically. Inside the box was the Ten Commandments. And, and uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and a pot of manna. And above, the, above that, higher up than that, is the mercy seat, the throne of God. For it says in James that mercy triumphs over judgment. All of that pictures God or Yeshua. And he's so much more. He's the coverings of the tabernacles, the ramskins and all the badger skins, all the things they have outside, the curtains, you know, it's amazing. But something very interesting about the high priest that we should remember on this day, he was the only one allowed to work, besides maybe a couple others to help him uh, take some of those carcasses out. Yeshua does all the work when it comes to us being atoned for by God. He does all the work. All we have to do is accept it, repent, turn to him, accept his call. Of course we do that. But the work of being saved is his work. Our, our sins being atoned for. God said he would destroy anybody who tried to work otherwise. This high priest is the one who killed the bull, who collected its blood. Have you ever tried killing a bull by yourself? He sprinkled it. He's the one who killed the goat for the sacrifice. He's the one who laid hands on the other goat, all the sins of the nation. Have you ever killed anything? I don't mean a fly or a mosquito. 
I mean, a deer. Have you ever killed a deer and skinned it? I have. Have you killed a live animal? A chicken, a goat, a turkey, a duck. All of those I have killed as a boy growing up in the Philippines. And they squirm and they move and you try to do it quickly. You don't try to do it slowly. And blood squirts out. There's blood because dra you're draining all the blood out. It can be a messy ordeal. And then slaughtering the animal, collecting the blood, or letting it drain out is what I mean. Preparing it for sacrifice, carrying it. I don't know if most of you can imagine that. If you've never done it, we go, we go down to the food store and get the packaged chicken already all wrapped up. It struck me this year of studying in all of this that Yah wants to make sure we understand that the work of cleansing us, atoning for us, the work of saving us, the work of reconciling us, the work of taking on all of our sins is exclusively the work of His Son to the glory of God the Father. It's the work of His Son who loved us all so much. He let His Son die. Some, I've heard some people say, well, Jesus was the one, Yeshua was the one who took all the pain. The person who said that was not a father. I've lost a son. And can you imagine God watching Yeshua on the cross? No wonder it was dark for three hours. And that was not an eclipse. Eclipse don't last that long. I don't think it was a very nice day for God. It pleased him to offer him because he loves all of us too. But what father would not have taken the beatings for his son? But anyway, atoning is solely his work. Abba in heaven doesn't want us thinking we're our own saviors. Do it yourself salvation. That we can work hard enough, we just might qualify to be in the kingdom. Have you heard words like that? He doesn't want us thinking we can save ourselves. He has qualified us, it says in Colossians, I think in chapter 1, towards the end of it, might be chapter 2. So the high priest was very busy with very bloody business. Can you imagine what he must have looked like at the end of that day? Can you imagine? On atonement day, the high priest was not dressed in his beautiful robes. He was in nice, pristine, white linen garment. I promise you, at the end of this day, he was one bloody mess. And I don't mean that as a curse word in England. I mean that as blood all over him. And that's the way Yeshua looked at the end of his sacrifice on the cross, on the tree. One bloody mess after all the scourgings and beatings. So it's a very, very positive thing that God says, you know, to all of us, I want you to rest. I have a gift. I have a gift for you. It's atonement. Reconciliation. It's my mercy. It's my love. I want to take all your unrighteousness and wash it away in the blood of my son. And I want you to have my righteousness, the gift of my righteousness. Romans 5.17. Go back and you can post that, please, Scott. Romans 5.17. The gift of my righteousness. Anyway, it's a joyous day also for a bunch of other things. I'll just do them quicker than my notes. I, I don't have time to go over all my notes. The high priest could come under great fear once a year on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies. When Yeshua died for me and for you, his body was cut open by a spear and out came blood and water. And the veil of the temple was rent, torn in two from top to bottom. Picturing the way into the Holy of Holies, the true Holy of Holies up above, 
God the Father was now open and any one of us could come any time and talk to him, be with him. Sometimes you've wondered why Adam and Eve didn't take of the tree of life sooner. Are we doing any better? Are we coming before God any better than Adam and Eve did? Frequently, all the time? Praying always? Hebrews 10, 19 to 22 talks about how Yeshua, how we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. It goes on from there to let's draw near. Another good thing about the, so the first thing about joyful is we can come anytime before God, let's be doing it. Another thing about the Day of Atonement, it was on the Day of Atonement, every 50 years, they blow the shofar. Wish I had my shofar here again. All debts were canceled. People who had to sell their land, their family farm, were allowed to have that land given back to the family. We know Israel will return to the land of Israel very soon after Yeshua lands on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 so it seems likely to me that the year of his return will be the correct jubilee year. Some think a jubilee year was 1917 when Israel kind of began, 1947, 1967, I mean, uh, was when they got Jerusalem back. And then, uh, so some think it might be 2067. I, I don't think it's going to go that long, I think. I think when Christ died on the cross, all our sins, debt, were canceled. I want to believe that was a jubilee year, and I think that was 30 AD. Jubilee years were great. No more enslavement. Slaves were freed. You now have the family land re returned to you. I'm going to go a little over time today because I want to cover these things. Another great reason to be update, upbeat about this day you're now in the book of life, but not just for one year. Jews, get this. Orthodox Jews believe they're in there for one year. So they try to amend their ways, so they get that one more year. That's nothing in the Bible says they'll give you one more year. Nothing. It's in their traditions that Yeshua said was causing them to miss out on the truth of God's word. You made God's law of none effect by your traditions, he said. So in the new covenant, we can be certain if we've repented, trusted in Yeshua, and changed from our sinful ways as a way of life, that our names are now in the book of life. Paul was very confident to say certain people, help these women, Philippians 4.3, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in, are in the book of life. John 5.24 Assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Whoever hears Yeshua and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Jews try to wear white. I happen to be wearing white today, but they, to be seen as righteous, we rejoice because we put on Christ as our garments. Romans 13, 14, put it up there. Put on the Lord Jesus. Don't be acting like you did before. Galatians 3, 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ who is now our life, Colossians 3, verse 4. So he's our life. He's our covering. He's our righteousness. I'm going to have to skip over a whole page here just for time's sake. So anyway, now let me read the last one here on, uh, on this page. Hebrews 9, verses 11 to 12. How are, we, how are we saved? We're rewarded by works. We're saved by grace. We're saved by hard work of the high priest of Yeshua, saved by his hard work. 
He, of course, is also pictured by the lamb and the goat and all those things and the bulls. Our works are imperfect and messed up. So God tells Israel, just sit in your tents and let me do a perfect work for you. Just sit in your tents and let me redeem you. Let me reconcile you. Let me atone for you. And he's going to say that to the whole world when he comes back. He's going to invite them to come and worship at the Feast of Tabernacles. And little by little, they'll come. It might take several years before the Egyptians and others will come, but they'll come. He wants us to rest in him. So many of us have a problem accepting that that hard work is by Yeshua, not by us. You need to repent of that. <laughs> you need to look to him. You can't do it to the holy perfection that God requires if you're trying to do it yourself. It's got to be holy perfection. So Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's not of this creation. He's, a, he's the tabernacle. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all. One time. For all time. No one's ever going to have to be Messiah and Savior again. Never again. One time, once for all, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption. Book of life forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, verses 24 to 28. Can you just put it up there, Scott? And uh, Christ appeared in the holy places, okay, in verse 26. He's appeared once at the end of the ages. He's appeared to put away sin. To put away sin. All the sin put on the head of the other goat. And he puts it away. By the sacrifice, that's the other goat, of himself. It's a twofold service here. As it's appointed to man, to man to die once after this, the judgment, Christ was offered one time, offered once, to bear the sins. He's the one who bears our sins, who bears the sins of many, not Satan. What a horrible, horrible doctrine that was when some believed it, including I, 25, 30, 40 years ago. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, and this time for salvation. Let's read one more. Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 14. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down. There were no chairs in the holy place. Priests had to keep working because their work of redemption had never stopped because people kept sinning and the blood of bulls and goats could never really truly wash away your sins, but the blood of Jesus could and did. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down at the right hand of God. His job was finished on, 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 on sacrificing. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has the tense here, for by one offering, he, for by one offering, he, not you, not me, he has perfected, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, those who are being set apart. By one offering, he has perfected you. I'm going to talk about that in a video sermon. I'm going to give did an audio one. I'm going to redo it. It's a video on, on the perfection. Be you therefore perfect as God in heaven is perfect. Anyway, I recommend you read and reread the above scriptures I've given you. They are so deep in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, and Le Leviticus 16. Uh, go back and read all of those and glorify your Father in heaven who wants to accept you as you accept Yeshua as your Savior, as your atoning sacrifice, as your King, as your Savior, as your husband-to-be, as your big brother, as your beloved. 
Surrender your self-will. Seek him. Tell him you're sorry for going the old way. You probably have to say that prayer several times. It's a time of introspection. It's a time of repentance. But it's also a time of great relief. It's a time of great joy that Yeshua has returned. And now he's telling the whole world, I'm offering you my atonement. It's a day all about our Father God and Yeshua. Our God the Father and Yeshua. What they've done for you and me. Nobody else can do it. It's for all of us. And the time's coming where the world's going to hear that on the Day of Atonement. And probably on that day, they'll, or soon around that time, they'll get rid of Satan. But no sins are put on his head. That was the bad part of the teaching. Father in heaven, we close this service now with you in Yeshua's mighty name, holy name, precious name, beloved name. Thank you. Just thank you. Doesn't seem enough. Wash us. Keep washing us. Continually wash us. Keep us clean. Keep us alert to where we're failing or falling short and come back to you and seek you. And let us grow to become more and more like you. But in the end, it's your righteousness, it's your perfection that you cover us with, the life of Yeshua. We seek it, we thank you for it. We praise you that he is the one on whom all the sins are put and sent far away from us, as far as east is from the west, and he is the one, Yeshua, you're the one. We shed your blood just like a goat had his throat slit and blood splattered everywhere, picturing what you did for us. We can't thank you enough, but we do. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit. Be sure you protect all your people in these terrible, dangerous times that are going to get more dangerous. We don't fear for we, because we look to you. Keep the COVID away from all of us. Keep the bomb blasts and the terrorism and the crime away and the bad health. Heal those who need your healing. Restore healing into your body, Father, please. We thank you and we praise you now for all these things. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.